Sebastian Kinier has had a stellar triathlon career spanning over 15 years, including three world titles and many, many race wins. This year is his final year as a pro as he tours the world, taking off some bucket list races before he hangs up that tri suit for good. I caught up with him here at one of those final races, challenged Samarkand in Uzbekistan to discuss his whole career. Sebi, thanks for joining us and thanks for uh, taking the time to chat. Looking forward to catching up with you. It's been a while. Well, firstly, we're in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan's not really on many bucket lists uh, of triathletes. Why Uzbekistan? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but that's actually the, the main reason is that it's not on a, on a lot of bucket lists. And um, I think that's what I've always loved about my, my sport is that it's enables us to, to see the world and travel the world. And obviously at one point you have the beaten path and I've been to Hawaii <laughs> a lot of times and uh, seen a lot of uh, different places. But I think I really also enjoyed uh, leaving uh, the beaten path and uh, visit countries like Bahrain, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Israel. I mean. That's a really, really cool thing because it really widens your horizon. You read a lot about countries in the newspaper, but it's a total different feeling if you're here. And yeah. I mean, you probably see more than any tourist here on the bike course because it's just a very scenic bike course. It kind of combines all the uh, yeah, scenic parts, uh, super uh, nice university. I think it's the first or one of the first universities in the, in the world. So uh, that's, that's quite quite cool. And Sounds I mean, like you know more about this place than I do. Well, we're <laughs> going to go around the back course later on and Sebi's actually going to, uh, he'll be my tour guide, I suppose, and show me around. Um, you're on your discontinued tour, um, traveling around the world, doing bucket list races and seeing places that you haven't seen before. How long is the discontinued tour going to be? You recently <laughs> did Norseman, tick that bucket list. How was that uh, challenging one? Uh, yeah. And how, long, how much longer is the discontinued tour going, or is it to be continued? To be honest, I, I mean, I woke up this morning a little bit of a sore throat. My Achilles is really arching, so I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if, it's, if the discontinued tour will be discontinued after, <laughs> oh, after this race. But um, no, to be honest, after, after Norseman, I thought this was it when it comes to long course racing. But I said this is my final year and not my final half year. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think I'm gonna do, I have one more good long course race in me and I've never done a long course race in Australia. So a nice place to, to, to end the discontinued tour with the Ironman Western Australia or what also would be a super nice place would be Ironman Cozumel. But it's not, not too many uh, races left. Uh, for me, it's a lot of lasts this yeah. year. Like the last race in Germany, the last big race in Germany, last long course race <laughs> in Germany. This will be my last uh, triathlon in Uzbekistan. Um, and so, <laughs> and your first. Yeah, um, a lot of, uh, I, I'm really milking that uh, discontinued yeah. theme. Yeah, we've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, hopefully your, this isn't your swan song and we do see you race Western Australia because I think that'll be a, a good one to end on. We just saw Jan Fredino bow out at, at Nice. Uh, he obviously chose a slightly higher profile in Uzbekistan to do his final race, but we'd love to see you race uh, in Western Australia. So hopefully that Achilles uh, is okay and we can get you to finish your discontinued tour on a high. Our journey is actually kind of parallel throughout our career. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our career. Um, you started kind of, you won uh, German duathlon champs. Uh, I started, I won provincial duathlon champs, and I'm just going to pretend that those two things are roughly the same, South African province <laughs> versus German nationals, you know, almost the same. Um, we both kind of bypassed short course careers. Uh, my reason was mostly because my swim was just not up to scratch. I would be out of it. Was it the same for you? <laughs> Most, most of the, yeah, most of it is the same. Um, uh, I just also wasn't ready to put the work in to really improve. I just didn't really like it, you know, um, on top of not really uh, being very talented <laughs> in swimming. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I kind of look back now and I almost feel like if I'd known my career was going to be as long as it was going to be. <laughs> it would I, have been worse to invest into swimming, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it would have been worth it to invest in swimming in those early years. But at the time, it was like, yeah. well, I'll just go into long course that I, I, I enjoy more anyway. And Completely the same. <laughs> um, if I could turn back the time, I would probably say like, yeah, I would have needed to join a squat. And uh, actually, if you were with a squat, squat swimming, um, it's so much more fun. And uh, so, but at that time, I was just like, kind of doing the lonely wolf uh, thing and uh, uh, lonely wolf is not swimming very well. No, that's true. Lone wolves do not swim very well. Uh, we both speak from experience. Uh, but you had a pretty successful career without doing the short course. Uh, so in 2009, you won your first uh, 70.3 in Wiesbaden. Uh, and then 2012, you won your first world title, 70.3 Worlds in Vegas. Uh, followed that up the following year by defending that title, 70.3 Worlds. Uh, before going on to podium in Kona, who good memories or difficult memories for me because that then led on to what I imagine is your career highlight the following year, winning Kona um, in 2014. Was that your career highlight, firstly? And secondly, was that podium in Kona in 2013 the thing that gave you the belief? Because it's actually little known or fairly well known fact that almost every Ironman world champion has podiumed the year before. Actually, a top four. Um, uh, was the requirement to win the year after. And uh, you missed actually out on uh, my very first uh, race in, in Kona in 2012, where I uh, became fourth place. And that was uh, probably more important race because I was leading the bike together with Marino von Hohenacker mm -hmm. and I fled it and um, I lost a lot of time, but I kind of yeah, rode my back, uh, my myself back into uh, into the into the race. Um, had the best bike split despite losing five plus minutes on the on the bike uh, due to the flat. Also because Marino later dropped out, and I learned a lot about the race in that very first year. Uh, it's always easy. You always say like you never give up, and everything can happen. Blah blah blah. But you have to <laughs> experience it to believe it. Mm -hmm. And in that race, I see what what can happen in this race, you know, especially because Marino was leading the race with something like five minutes and he dropped out at the uh, entrance of the energy lab. Mm -hmm. um, just, I mean, you're in the lead at the world championships. Can you just squeeze out another percent? <laughs> no, you no. just can't. Yep. You just can't. When you're done, you're and done. Absolutely. And um, I think that kind of told me everything I need to know also from myself that it's always worth to keep trying until the very end and also to believe that everything is possible, um, that people can drop out in front of you, but also that you don't start to celebrate before you actually cross the finish line. Good lessons, all of those. I, uh, I think I'm going to disagree with you there because you didn't come back from fourth to win. You came back from fourth to get third, third. and then you came back from third to exactly. win. I got fourth <laughs> behind you when you got third. And I never went on to win, so I'm not sure. I think you have to finish on the podium before you. <laughs> you can no, win. I think um, with uh, there has been a very long ongoing statistic, and it's indeed uh, force. Um, uh, so, so I, I must, think I we'll, we'll contact <laughs> we'll, we'll contact Thorsten, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the the interesting thing is that uh, rules like this seem to not apply anymore in our sport because. Some well, guys just uh, changed yeah. the rules. Well, Sam Ledlow just won, and he was uh, on the podium last year. So uh, he's not so for Gustav Eden. Uh, he <laughs> uh, won it on first attempt. So yeah, this is true. We already spoke about one of the regrets: not looking, not working on your swim early on. Any other regrets in your career? Things you can look back on and go, "I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that." Oh yeah, a lot, like a ton. I think we would need an hour to talk about all of them. But I collected a lot of second places in my career. And I think that's also something that really, uh, I mean, about the wins, I kind of deleted them from the hard drive pretty quick, but I can still remember losing, uh, you know, the sprint uh, for, the, for the finish uh, against uh, Speedy Reedy at Mulu, Mululaba, uh, 70.3 Worlds, which uh, would have been another title. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2014, yeah, I won the race um, in Kona, but that also came with quite a huge toll, um, but at the at the time I didn't really realize that I I just you know I had massive problems with my Achilles, but I just kept continuing, uh, kept continuing racing also afterwards, and I was in good shape. But 
I was just, yeah, um, you know, uh, taking advice, like harden the f up. I hardened up, but um, <laughs> the problem is at one point, like uh, it doesn't, it's not really fun uh, yeah. to tell yourself that every morning when you get up. So sometimes it would have just been good to, uh, just like you said with swimming, imagine that your career lasts another five or six years. And, but as athletes, we are often just, you're only as good as your last race. You're only as good as your last training session, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You can't really enjoy sometimes. And it's also quite hard to yeah, see the bigger picture sometimes. And therefore we have coaches and a team around us, but at the end it's about you, what you do with it and what you tell the coaches. And that's another thing I can remember going into Daytona um, 2020, which was a really important race for me. I was very, very fit and I had a calf issue. I didn't talk, told my coach because I knew he will dial back me quite a lot in, in training. I didn't told him, I f***ed up the calf, um, uh, ended up having serious Achilles problems again after the race, dropping out in the race. Yeah, so yeah. there is, <coughs> I think um, <laughs> if, somebody, if somebody tells you like, yeah, no, I have no regrets, it's kind of weird because that would meant like he didn't make any mistakes. Yeah. He, f he thinks he can't do anything better. I'm not sure about that. I mean, um, if people say like, yeah, but you won this and that race, but that's not the thing. You always wanted to win more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not always, never enough. Always failures along the way. Imagine we could uh, get our youth back with all the wisdom we have now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would be good. Then uh, I would probably hold hold back too much. It's it's very difficult to uh, to say uh, because experience is very a very True. slippery slope. Like you also know. I mean, my very first long course race in Ross. I told with no experience. I didn't know about the suffering that will go on at one point. Naivety. Or the, so the I just distance. go and went full speed to hit the wall. And later, you're actually afraid to hit the wall. So mm -hmm. you slow down before you hit it. So I'm not sure about if experience really helps. Yeah. So I'm not sure in what I'm really course, talking yeah. about any, anyway. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I don't regret anything. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, everything happened for a reason. No, I mean, uh, yeah. there is there is a lot to be said for the naivety of youth and not knowing how how much that second half of an Ironman marathon <laughs> hurts <laughs> for sure. Um, let's talk about triathlon in general. Um, the PTO has come come to light in the last few years. Um, you're one of those initial members trying to get it off the ground um, back in the back in the early days when we had a meeting in Bahrain and. Uh, Nothing really came of it for a good few years. We did try our, our best. We really did try, uh, but nothing really came of it for a good few years. Um, finally, it did catch on, and now there's a lot of money being invested in the sport. How do you see this affecting the sport? Um, I know, obviously, everyone looks at it on the surface, and more money is great, particularly for the pros. It's good for the sport in general. It's good for growth. However, in sport, maybe more than anywhere else, more money means more problems. I mean, we're going to see more incentive to cheat, more incentive to take chances, more incentive to dope. Um, you know, more incentive, not, e not even on the cheating and doping side, but the, the incentive for guys who are young to take risks with their, la with their career, with their health, you know, 21-year-olds doing Ironmans, <coughs> that kind of thing, for money. Um, wh where do you see this double-edged sword of triathlon is now, and do you think it's all a good thing, or do you think uh, it needs to be very carefully... Handled. Like you said, it's just in between those two extremes. Um, so on the one hand side, like you like you said, money is in general a good thing, especially uh, the way the PTO spends it is a lot different from what you know from any other um, race organizer. So even if you're within the top 100 of the PTO ranking, you still get a little bit of money out of it. And there are systems like maternity leave and, uh, and stuff. It's, it, this is like really, really good. And also uh, what I specifically like is the idea to make like a world championship series. I've always, I mean, that's where I really want to turn back the time and be part of this. Yeah. Because when I look at other sports that are niche sports, and our sport is not a niche sport from um, the, the amount of participation in the general public. Yeah. Uh, let's take biathlon, for example, which a lot of people still get confused, <laughs> um, but it's skiing and shooting, cross-country skiing and shooting. 
Uh, it's not a mass participation sport in Germany, but it's a mass TV sport. And that's mainly due to the fact that they see the same athletes every second weekend or every weekend during the winter time. So the people can really get involved into yeah. the sport. And that's, I think, with the PTO series, we already seen that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have more athlete profiles and they actually hand out contracts to the athletes, which in my op um, opinion is helping especially like young athletes because uh, it doesn't matter if they're injured or not, they get a certain uh, amount of payment. So it's actually probably less risks and it's just a great opportunity for, for young athletes because they actually don't have to do Ironman racing to make a living if you are not uh, wanting to do a, a race for the Olympics and uh, with the Federation. I, I'm more skeptical about the short course racing actually because the pressure there is so much higher. You only have the Olympics every four years. Like it's probably a once in a lifetime chance. What are you willing to risk mm. for a once in a lifetime chance? Like, I mean, it's the, the stakes there are much higher yeah. versus the series. I think is actually quite nice to for for the athletes to develop um, as well for for long course athletes for future long course athletes. So I think that's good. And then also. Uh, the PTO is not just putting money into the sport, but they're also developing rules. Like we put the range race, race, race ranger system on mm -hmm. the bikes, um, 20 meter rule, which makes the race not just fairer, but also uh, much more easy to officiate and much more safer because also there's more space for motorbikes and, and stuff. And then you can see races where, let's say Dallas, for example, yep. flat bike course, a really dense field, but it's still able for guys to ride away from the front, yeah. you know? Yeah. Usually you would have said that's not possible. Um, so I think it's, um, it's not just money, it's also applying rules, having good officials, having the same officials, having a good broadcast. That's how you grow the sport. But still, um, it needs to be sustainable. And I think that's the most important thing. I, from my feeling, I sense from a lot of athletes, they they don't believe yet that it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. They think it's there for like two, three years. So they're not really getting invested into it. Um, I would love to see my fellow pro athletes to actually m contribute more towards that and also add some value because you also have to have in mind why you're getting paid. And yep. uh, it's not just going there, get the check and fly back home. It's like actually you have to do something for the for the race and for the series and so on. So I hope athletes understand that yeah. it's about them. Creating them those too. Yeah. creating those stories and narratives that go through the whole through the whole season is obviously that much easier to follow and more interesting for the spectators and makes the races more interesting. But the flip side of that, obviously, for the pros, is that when you do get an injury, you can't just go crawl into your hole and sort it out. You have to you have to show the world. You have to you have to carry on the story. People need to see see the whole story. 100%, but I think that, that doesn't really change with the, uh, with the series and also not with the money. I think um, uh, the pressure is always high and if there is less money, it, it always be, will be more top heavy. Yep. So uh, that probably even increases the incentive to, to, to cheat and take, take risks. So I'm not 100% uh, convinced if more money leads to more cheating in, in general, as this said. But yeah, of course, uh, if you have more financial resources, it's probably yeah. you can also have more resources to, to, to cheat. And I mean, there's a reason why we're talking about this. Is yeah. We have seen it in the past. Well, so, I, you, yeah. I know you don't have an answer because you can't no. have an answer no. to this, but- Nobody has. I'm going to ask the question anyway. Doping, you've always been a staunch, outspoken critic of dopers and doping in sport. How prevalent do you think it is? How much of a problem? We saw Colin Chartier get pinged last year, and obviously that was a shockwave through the whole of yeah. triathlon. Um, he had just won the PTO US Open, and everyone was like, oh my God. Was Colin Chartier an outlier, or was catching Colin Chartier a, an outlier? It definitely uh, made me uh, think about it again, because until that case, I was, I mean, not that this wasn't present anymore, but when I grew up in the sport, um, we had a huge scandal within the Tour de France, um, mm -hmm. Team Telecom back then. Um, uh, and, you know, it was so present also in the triathlon world um, at that time uh, that we had this, um, it was called Iron Transparency Project in, in Germany. So 
from the get go, I was got tested uh, really a lot. Like I, I think in 2014, I uh, had something like uh, 24 out of competition tests, which is <laughs> really crazy. I mean, I had I can remember I have five. I think I had four or five tests just in the Kona race week alone. Yeah, just, just ringing out of your doorbell every couple of days. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't want to dive too much into this, but um, <clears throat> so. Um, but the thing that always made me convinced that this is a very clean sport is, first of all, of course, I have no proof for that, but I was winning the Ironman World Championships clean and I've not been this was the exactly hardest worker audience. ever. Yeah. I've not been the most talented guy ever. Exactly, so I actually said this to someone the other day. They were like, how can you know it's clean? Yeah. And I said, I can't know it's clean, but I know I can come fourth and fifth at Kona yeah. and I didn't have the best days so there was some stomach cramps that kind of, I could go 10 minutes faster yeah. and I know I'm clean which means you yeah. can win it clean now you have to, obviously like the sport is developing rapidly yeah and uh, at the same time we uh, we have what I sense was probably the biggest one of the biggest doping cases in our sport mm -hmm. with Colin and um, so definitely I was quite quite shocked I still believe that the sport is clean and that you can become world champion without doing uh, anything shady but that's just based on what I experienced within the last 20 years so if it would be very common I always thought like yeah somebody would have offered you something you mm -hmm. would have seen something first I but after the calling case it's like always, you know, people start to, to talk and rumors spread about certain athletes. And uh, it's, it's definitely, I'm not so sure than I was like five, six years ago. Also, you had the stretch where we had COVID and then you see athletes develop. And uh, so I'm really torn. The issue obviously being with COVID, testing was pretty much impossible. The, yeah. You know, authorities couldn't, couldn't travel the world and go to people's doors during COVID. And it was almost like this window where people who had the opportunity or had the inclination had this opportunity to take advantage of the fact that they knew no one was coming. So therefore it's not put my hand into the fire like for every athlete because I didn't knew Colin like super well, but yeah. I thought I like, kind of know him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a problem. Just because you, are, you seem to be a nice guy doesn't mean you are, you're not a, a cheater. And, uh, and that's yeah. pretty, pretty, it was really tough to, to swallow for me. Yeah, it's a hard thing to learn, unfortunately. And then obviously, we also had the Thomas Steger um, case. Yeah. And um, it's, the problem with that is also, I, uh, whether Colin admitted it, and uh, I mean, whether you believe all of uh, what he said or not, um, it, he, he didn't try to find any excuse versus Thomas, I, I, I'm really torn apart. Like, 50% yeah. of myself is really believing his story. The other 50% yeah. is like... For those who oh. don't know, Thomas Steger has been served a ban. Uh, they found banned substances in his house. A doping investigation basically raided his house. Uh, found uh, asthma medication in his house. He claims he never used it. He didn't test positive for it, um, but because he was in possession of it, um, and he says it was his dad's, um, but he's been served to ban anyway because of it after a long investigation. Um, so he claims obviously it wasn't his and it was never tested positive. So it's a very, it's not quite the same as the Colin Chartier case, which was very cut and dried. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, as I say, as I said in the beginning, you don't really, you can't really, can't really have an answer, but it is interesting to get your opinion on that. But um, just to finish this off, I think where uh, um, the PTO definitely also needs to step in and step up is especially in this in this topic like um, if you are racing PTO series, I would like to see the athletes get at least five six uh, out of competition yep. tests um, per year. In some countries, this is act actually absolutely the norm, or it's even the very low limit. Yeah. But in some countries, it's not. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if sorry to take this time, no, but no I think. Problem. An idea from Jan van Berkel, retired um, uh, professional from yeah. Switzerland. It's at least you. We need to consider this: is that the athletes can vote for an athlete to get tested. Some might say, like, "Wow, this is like pretty crazy," but I think a lot of athletes know yep. and have a sense. And even the athlete 
that will get tested. It's in his very own interest that he get tested because that's the only kind of way where he can say like, okay, yeah. but I'm also getting tested out of competition. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you can't call uh, uh, yeah. doping control I and say like, please, please, test me. please test me more yeah. often because yeah. I want to be tested True. and I want to put it out there that I have out of True. competition control. So yeah. that's at least, I mean, this is a very slippery slope, obviously, but I think something like this needs yeah. to be considered and I think implemented an, an from anonymous the flag in flagging a suspicious athlete people can yeah. they can then test them and prove their innocence yeah. i uh, yeah i mean it obviously is the onus is to a certain extent on the pto to to do something to make sure that that it is clean yeah. um, there are limits on what what they can do potentially also you can't race in a pto event until you've been on whereabouts for a certain amount of time yeah. um, because there are people who come out of the blue almost uh, and can win major sums much like Colin Chartier did, and then get put on whereabouts, which is almost closing the bond or after the horse is bolted. It needs to be, I mean, for example, myself, if I wanted to race again as a professional, I have to go on whereabouts yeah. again for six months before yeah. I'm even allowed to start a race. Yeah. Because I said to the, the anti-doping authorities when I retired, I'm retiring. And they sent me a letter saying, sign this if you ever want to race again as a professional. You have to notify us six months before you're allowed to race. And in um, Germany, it's the other way around. Like when you retire, you're still on whereabouts for six months because they assume probably you're going to change, change your mind and yeah. come want, and you want to come back. But I don't know how is it is now. Maybe I have to look into that <laughs> you pretty this, soon. Probably this, soon, this month but, um, you should be looking into that. Yeah, because whereabouts can be quite tough if you travel a lot and yeah. uh, you also always a little bit on the risk to that you get, get a mid-test. three so. missed tests yeah. after you finished your discontinued <laughs> that, that would be, <laughs> be the irony. cherry on the yeah, cake. Very right. ar ironic. We've, we've spoken about uh, the leaps in performance that have happened recently and there have been some big leaps in performance. Um, there are a lot of factors to consider in this. I think from our, one of the big ones is obviously the super shoes. I think they're making a big difference to triathlon, particularly because yeah. you're running on tired legs from a bike. Absolutely. And I think they're making a very big difference. <laughs> Another factor is obviously, it's 25 years now since the Olympic Games, well, yeah. triathlon was announced in the Olympic Games. Are we seeing a crop of athletes that have dreamt about being triathlon professionals pretty much since they could speak yeah. versus what you and, my, you, you and me potentially, who, who only were exposed to it much later and also saw it as a potential career even later than that. You know, when we were kids, being a professional triathlon, triathlete wasn't really an option. It was, a, it was a hobby that you did on the side of whatever you were, you were pursuing. Whereas now, these kids, is that what we're seeing? Is that why, why these performances are going up or was it just the super shoes? All of the above, I think. Um, First of all, like when you said performances in triathlon, I think it's important to first see what you mean with performance. And uh, I would say, okay, times, just the time. So uh, therefore the, the times got faster. I'm not always sure if the performance really got better because I can remember seeing a power file from uh, Norman Stadler. And when he, when he won uh, uh, Kona, I think he wrote something like 305 watts average, which will still be uh, enough to make one of the fastest or the fastest bike split in Kona um, if you have a super fast setup. But back then, if you look yeah, at the bike... Depending on how much you weigh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you look at the bike from Norm yeah. he, that he was riding, it's just, I mean, it's yeah. like... <laughs> it's, I, I would say my whole setup... It, it's easily 50 watts faster yeah. um, than his at the same speed. So there has been a lot of development in all the things. And I mean, that's not marginal gains. That's yeah. like huge gains, yeah. but they Big. took 20 years to, to happen. You touch on the super shoes and I 100% agree. It's not just in racing, it's also in training. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I, If I had those shoes in 2014, I would have been able to run way higher volume mm -hmm. because they are so much more gentle on your Achilles than these absolutely racing flats where yeah. we used to wear on, on a track. And if you're a little bit of a heavier athlete, I think you take way more out of that than, uh, than a super runner um, yeah. does. Just looking at my time, for example, when I won 70.3 Worlds, I was running like 116 or 114 or something like yeah. that. And then in Nice, it was the first race where I, where I wore a super shoe. I, I uh, ran just uh, a touch under 110, I think, or so. Yeah. It's like five minutes uh, quicker, and I don't think I was in a better shape back then. Yeah. And the training is interesting, too, because <coughs> yeah. obviously 
it's not just racing on tired legs. A lot of your run training is also on. You're, you're doing 15 hours of, on the bike during the week and you're running on the back of that. So you're running on tired legs too. And also the recovery after the race. I can remember being, I mean, your legs like completely shattered after a long course race. With these shoes, it's definitely a different, yeah. um, different thing. But then I think at the end, the most important thing is really, like you said, this is the first generation of uh, triathletes that actually, yeah, got raised as triathletes. I mean, uh, yeah. especially when the US put a triathlon as a college sport, you know, it has so much more uh, um, depth in, uh, in, in talent and uh, way, way more bigger pool of athletes. And then you, you, you also, I mean, the, I see it in, in Germany, you know, it, um, with the results of, of uh, Jan and, uh, and Patrick and also myself, uh, putting it on the map in mainstream media. And um, that's also an important thing, you know, is yeah. that the people want to, have, that the kids want to have role, role models and uh, they see it and they see that you can make a living out of it. And uh, so, yeah, that's, I think it's a lot of things. A lot of things coming together. Let's go back to you personally and looking ahead after the discontinued tour is eventually discontinued. What are you going to do? Are you going to be involved in sport of triathlon? Are you going to are you going to look to change the sport of triathlon? I mean, you've got a lot of ideas clearly, as you've said here today. Um, are you going to get involved in the politics of triathlon, or are you just going to stay on the on the sidelines, or are you just going to step away from triathlon altogether? Uh, it was kind of funny because I just came back from from Nice commentating and and for German TV and uh, hearing Jan say like he don't have. He didn't have any plans for the day after uh, the race. And for me, it's like I have too many plans. <laughs> like it's uh, definitely too many ideas. And uh, I can't, yeah, uh, probably uh, check all the boxes. But uh, yeah, we'll definitely be involved in, uh, in the sport. Um, I like the, the, the commentating uh, job quite, quite a lot, even if it can be quite demanding, I have to say. But um, yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it. You, you still really feel attached to the, the athletes and the, yeah. the guys you know and uh, um, I think it's also an important part to to educate the, the wider audience um, about the, the sport it's good if somebody is there that yep. really knows something about it and obviously it's if you're just doing the nerd talk it's too much but <laughs> um, then for next year especially, I'm going to ease myself out of the sport by doing a couple of gravel races. That's uh, definitely one of the things I want to do is, I think it's, um, I don't know how Jan does it, but for me that's the reason why I did this whole discontinued tour is I just couldn't put the handbrake on and end 30 years of my life like that. Um, from one day to another, not being a, an athlete. I think I really had to, it's like a drug, you know, you have to do a little bit of rehab. I'm, re, I'm rehabbing uh, already a little bit. Off yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I'll also be a little bit involved in, in coaching um, with Kick-Ass mm -hmm. Sports, the yep. company of Laura, Philip and uh, Philip Seip, my former coach. Yep. So there's plenty of ways I'll be involved in the sport and in the sport of triathlon, but there will also be a couple of things that uh, will have nothing to do with the sport. Probably becoming a carpenter or something, you know. <laughs> carpenter, interesting. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is what I realized is like swimming up and down a pool. Um, uh, you exit the pool, you don't see your there's no, your work, there's no product you know, of there's your work. No, yeah, no, it's enough like to make something peaks, real. Uh, green <laughs> green check, training peaks is all you get. <laughs> uh, that's not always very fulfilling. And uh, so I think I have to do at least a little bit something where you see Actually have a result of end, your work. An end product. Yeah. And no, uh, no other sporting goals. I mean, you, you, you did Cape Epic a few years ago. Not going to go and have another crack at that or UTMB yeah. maybe? Probably. I mean, not UTMB. I mean, uh, my, like I said, my Achilles is not super happy. I think that's uh, probably not something that's going to happen. But um, yeah, I mean, gravel and, uh, and I mean, some would say Cape Epic is basically a gravel race, <laughs> uh, depending on yeah. um, where, you, where you do. Uh, it, but um, yeah, I, that 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 would be a couple of uh, things I want to do um, for sure. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, we've uh, we've covered all the bases. I'm going to say thank you very much to Sevi and thank congratulations you. on an absolutely superb career. Um, we've 
followed it with interest the whole way. Me, of course, very closely because I was uh, right there with you for a lot of it. Um, you've managed to squeeze a couple more years than I managed out of it. So, so well done on that. And uh, good luck for the rest of the discontinued tour. Uh, we'll be following that too. And we'll definitely be following with interest what you do afterwards. Thanks again, Sebi. Thanks for having me.